now, an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Artbeat Nation, a rebellious style meets haute couture. I think what's interesting is that there seems to be a disjuncture between the idea of haute couture and punk. An artist travels back to the 1900s to perfect the craft of photography. Learning from your mistakes is the, the long learning curve, I think, with it. Chicano art is placed at the center of a cultural movement. The art is expressed in our DNA. And the man behind the superhero is revealed. I always wanted to draw and tell a story in pictures. And my dream came true. It's all ahead on this edition of Artbeat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. Punk fashion was meant to be a rebuttal to all the cultural excess of the 60s and 70s. The style was supposed to highlight the individuals, the politically conscious, the disenfranchised. Even though punk style continues to pay homage to rebels, it has now been recognized as high fashion that can be worn by all who crave an outlet to express themselves. Next, we visit the Punk Chaos to Couture exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and we learn how punk high fashion became established. The exhibition um, really focuses on the impact of punk on high fashion. We wanted to start off the exhibition with the origins of punk, both in New York and in London, in a way to contextualize the fashions on display. New York is really where punk originated. Patti Smith once famously said that all the action happened in the toilets at CBGB's. We have recreated the toilet and presented it as a period room. Primarily, punk in New York was more of a music phenomenon with artistic and intellectual underpinnings, whereas punk in, in London was more of a fashion movement, really, and it had more socio-political underpinnings. In London, we recreated the boutique 430 Kings Road, which was a boutique that was created by Mark McLaren and Vivian Westwood. And I think more than any other designer, it really was Vivian Westwood and Mark McLaren who not only crystallized the look of punk, but also commercialized it. I think one of the sort of critiques of the co-option of punk by high fashion designers is the fact that it's for commercial gain. But punk, as, as articulated by McLaren and Westwood, it very much was a commercial enterprise. Bridging the Tale of Two Cities is a room called Clothes for Heroes, and Clothes for Heroes was a slogan under which McLaren and Westwood marketed their fashions, their clothes. And what we've done is actually juxtapose original um, punk fashions by McLaren and Westwood with uh, contemporary designers like Christopher Bailey for Burberry, Rodate, really to show the sort of enduring impact of McLaren and Westwood's punk aesthetic. After you go through Clothes for Heroes, the remaining sections of the exhibition uh, are really focusing on high fashion. And to me, I think that the greatest and most enduring legacy of uh, the punk aesthetic is the idea of do-it-yourself. There's four manifestations of do-it-yourself. As originally articulated by punks in the mid-70s, the gallery hardware focuses on perhaps the most obvious and the most formalistic aspects of do-it-yourself, which is the sort of hardware that punks use to imbue their clothing with an aesthetic of violence, um, anarchy, and even cruelty. So pieces like studs or safety pins or chains or zippers, these are perhaps the most obvious go-to aspects of punk fashion that designers have appropriated. Designers like Versace, but it also has um, garments by Zandra Rhodes, um, dated to 1977, um, from a collection called the Conceptual Sheet Collection. And that really was the first time that a designer copted the punk aesthetic for, for high fashion. The next gallery is bricolage, and bricolage references the found objects that um, punks often would incorporate into the clothing, primarily as really a critique on the idea of good taste and also aspects of consumerism. And punks often would co-opt uh, objects from the basest of contexts. 
and they would incorporate those uh, into their clothing really as a manifestation or a challenge to uh, what we mean by good taste and bad taste. I think one of the heroes of that gallery is Martin Margiela. Martin Margiela is known for incorporating found objects into his clothing. So we have waistcoats made out of broken ceramic dishes um, held together with wire. Um, in the centre of that gallery are some extraordinary dresses by the designer Gareth Pugh, which are entirely made out of um, garbage bags that he's shredded to look like feathers and, and fur. The third gallery after Grip Bricolage is a gallery called Graffiti. And graffiti is similar to hardware in the fact that it's a very self-evident expression of do-it-yourself. And it references the slogans and the stenciling and the different types of graffiti that punks would use as a way of challenging the establishment and challenging the status quo. I think one of the highlights is perhaps a dress by Alexander McQueen. And in the middle of that gallery, we have four ball gowns by Dodge and Gabbana. And then the final gallery is called Destroy. And Destroy looks at, I think, perhaps what is the most enduring legacy of the DIY aesthetic on high fashion, which is the idea of deconstructionism, and references the rips, tears, and slashes that punks would incorporate into their clothing, really as symbols of urban um, dereliction and urban destitution. I think the hero of that gallery is probably Ray Kawakuba. And I think more than any other designer, um, Ray has taken on the mantle of punk. She looks to punk almost as an intellectual paradigm. She's continued the idea of rips and tears into her fashions, but she goes many steps further in deconstructionism where she in a way challenges the formal logic of clothing by having jackets morphing into skirts, skirts morphing into jackets with arms protruding on the skirt. So her clothes not only take on the punk tactics of shock and provocation. They continue the language of punk into a 21st century idiom. I think what's interesting is that there seems to be a disjuncture between the idea of haute couture and punk. But I think both very much focused on concepts of individuality and concepts of novelty. And I think that's, that's something they share very much in common. I think what was interesting about punks is that they did challenge these very normative conventions of beauty and fashion. And I don't think you're seeing that anymore on the street, and where you really are seeing it is the runway. So in that respect, high fashion has completely overtaken punk in terms of um, this, this arena in which individualism, which creativity, in which artistic expression is celebrated above the idea of just um, the status quo. To learn more about the exhibit, visit metmuseum.org. Giles Clemen is a photographer who has brought the 20th century craft of wet plate photography to the present. Giles takes us through the old-fashioned process of creating an image that can be beautiful, haunting, and everlasting. My name is Giles Clement and I'm a wet plate collodion photographer. So you want a photo of you and your dog for your dad? Yes. Okay. I'm Ashley Schaefer. I'm here to have a portrait taken by Giles. Send to my dad and make him happy. We have Jack alongside your face there. Mm -hmm. And then we just got to keep him parallel to your eyes so he stays in focus and you do too. And hopefully he doesn't hate the flash too much, right? He's going to hate it. Oh, Jack, Jack. Wet plate was invented in 1851 and then used up until uh, the early 1900s. wet plate you have to make the plate shoot it and develop it in 10 minutes or so. So that's why it's called wet plate because the whole process is wet and it's a very fluid, fluid fast moving, uh, fast paced thing. So you sit here and you just wait for him to do his thing and then you get flashed <laughs> and you're done. You're okay. It can be I think better. It's cute. We can do better and just yeah, I, really I just good. had some dirt that got on right there and then those drools are from uh, from the top running down. So you want to just try another one and we'll get it sure. better. Okay. I just start with a regular piece of black glass and I pour collodion on it and it's a solution of uh, cotton mixed with alcohol, ether and some acid. 
when I dunk the plate into a tank of silver nitrate, the silver nitrate reacts with the chemicals in the collodion and the silver then becomes light sensitive. So essentially what I'm doing is just taking a piece of black glass and turning it into a piece of film that I can then take a picture on. When I'm in the dark room there, I put the plate in like this and then close it and then that holds the, uh, the film and this is what goes into the camera. And then there's a dark slide that, that protects it and when I'm ready to take the picture, I'll pull that dark slide out and you can see the film or the, the glass right there. So the image is made right on that. Yeah, that's, that's good, that's good. Okay, you good there? Yeah. You're just looking into this big lens and don't really know what's going on because it doesn't really do a whole lot. It just sits there. The lens is made in 1849, so it's 164 years old. And it actually predates wet plates. So it was made for daguerreotypes, which is the first real method of photography. If everything's going fine, it, it's easy and anybody can do it. But it's when it's when things start to, to go wrong, then try to troubleshoot, find out what's going on. Learning from your mistakes is the the long learning curve, I think, with it. You actually pour the developer right over the plate. It'll go from just being a white, it just looks like yellowish white, the silver, and you'll see a, a negative image emerge out of the out of the uh, the white. And you'll take that and put it in the fixer, and that's really where the image is made. You see a blank piece of glass, basically, and then you see an image magically kind of appear on it. I like that it's, it's always really cool and fun to see come to light. You know, a digital picture, an Instagram or whatever, it's, it's, you know, it's here, here one second and you forget about it the next, you know, it's on your hard drive somewhere. And this is something that, you know, you can hang on your wall and it's gonna last 200 years or more. It's very addicting. It's really difficult to do and it's difficult to perfect. And I always wanna get it perfect or as close to perfect as I can. So I just keep, I keep going and keep going and keep going. and. I, I certainly don't get bored. <laughs> Frustrated, yes. Bored, not so much. To learn more about Giles Clement, visit uninstagram.com. In the 1960s and 70s, the Chicano art movement was at its height in America. Up next, we explore the Legacy Project, an exhibit revolving around the movement and the art that it inspired at the Museo de las Americanas, located in Denver, Colorado. This movement was evolved or was grown out of necessity. In the 1970s and 1980s in Colorado, uh, Chicano art was not recognized as a, an aesthetic form. It was a very difficult uh, position for the, for the artists at that time to be able to have opportunities to exhibit and to be um, respected for the work they did. What changed was the political movement of the 1960s and 70s, the Chicano movement, the farm workers movement, and all the different opportunities that those movements opened the doors. During our time, either you were present at the moment or you were gone. At that time, if you firm believe that women values were important, you better put it up in the canvas and you make it your statement. Our lives were a little difficult at the beginning, um, 
but we never lost hope. And we formed a wonderful uh, organization uh, called CHAC, which is the Chicano Humanities and Arts Council. When that organization came to fruition, we had the opportunity to exhibit and sell our work and for us to begin to develop our name. And that is actually over 30 years ago. I, I met Luisa Barca in about 1980. Luisa Barca was, is a Mexican national who came here to the States uh, with you know, virtually no money and became a very successful businessman. Luis was very, had a profound interest in, in the civil rights movement and, and just the whole Chicano experience here. Uh, Luis uh, you, you know, became familiar with, with what was going on in, in, in the movement. So he developed this idea of bringing very important Latin American and Mexican artists the best that he could find, invite him into Denver, and then invite the Chicano artists to have a conversation. Many artists at that time who were working together and talking together and um, painting together what was in their corazón, what's in the heart, and expressed it in all the different ways that they did. All of us made a difference together. What makes this exhibit significant is the participation of artists such as Manuel Martinez, Steven Lucero, Arlette Lucero, John Encinas, John Flores, Carlos Sandoval, Carlos Martinez, Daniel Salazar, Ramon Kelly, all of those people who contribute to the movement of the Chicano art in Colorado. This exhibit for me is a way to, to remind people of the great contributions of Chicano artists to the art scene in Denver. And also is to honor my peers and to tell them that the work that they have done have opened doors for the new generation of Chicano artists and the new Latino aesthetic. I felt that art was a good medium, you know, to, to, bring, to educate our, our people and to continue the long artistic expressions that we've had for the thousands of years, you know, on, on our Indian side and then the Spanish side with our European side because we're mestizo people. As for the legacy um, and what we have brought to the city, I see young artists who are now doing their art um, inspired by the artists that you see here. The art is expressed in our DNA. It's what connects you. Connects you to yourself, and you, connects you to your community, connects you to everyone around you. Uh, I see the history of what we did, what we are doing, what we will do. Um, it's beautiful. To learn more about the museum, visit museo.org. These days, it seems superheroes are everywhere, leaping off the page and into big screen blockbusters and beyond. But nearly three quarters of a century earlier, these comic books were meant to thrill young audiences in a simpler way. Enter Alan Bellman, a young man who loved to doodle. Now a retiree in South Florida, we reveal his secret identity as the man who drew Captain America. My name is Alan Bellman, and I work for Timely Marvel Comics in 1942. I started doing backgrounds, Captain America. I always wanted to draw comics. My father had a bakery. Every chance I had, I'd draw on the paper bag. And uh, I'd open a book, and there was a white space in a hard-covered book. I drew in there. It's just something you have in you. It was Columbus Day, 1942. And I said to my dad, I says, I'll go tomorrow, it's a holiday. He said, no, you go today. 
I said, Dad, and we went back and forth, back and forth, and I, and he won. And I thanked my dear dad because I don't know where I'd be now if I didn't listen to him. Because I got that job in 10, 15 minutes. They said, you start Monday. I went to the High School of Industrial Art, and I went on and off at night at Pratt Institute. But actually, it was on the job that I got my training and the ability to improve, the opportunity to keep improving my work. And I always work and strive to have a better job. I was never really ever happy with whatever I do, even now. I always feel I could do better, more and more, but when I do a drawing for a fan, I want it to be good. I'm so happy to draw it the old way because this is what the fans want. When I get a note or email saying, Mr. Bellman, you made me happy with your work. It's framed. This means more to me than anything else. It's just a, a personal gratification that I get that I can make someone happy. It was just my art. They like my art. Some stories I love to do more than other stories. It, it's like a actor getting a script and they read the script and they say not for me and they give it to somebody else it becomes a big hit you know but the fact is it's the same thing but certain stories just would motivate me more than other scripts doing a comic book or doing any kind of comic strip is doing a movie you have your long shot your close-up your bird's eye view worm's eye view you have to change each panel so you keep the interest of the reader a lot is left to the imagination, and the writer would describe saying, uh, have him drinking or something to that effect, but uh, use your own imagination. It's like I said, it's like doing a movie, and you have to think as a movie with still pictures. There was one book already written about the comic book industry, but it came and went. But I had spoken to many writers, I said, why don't you write a book? about the comic book industry. Everyone had a story to tell. You're living in the best country of the world. The opportunities are here. You cannot give up. You cannot surrender with rejection because you will hit somewhere. Learn how to draw. Do not copy the comic book characters because you'll never learn to draw. Learn how to draw anatomy a woman's anatomy, a man's anatomy. So when you put the costume on a man, you will know where the muscles are. You'll know where the hands are. I always wanted to draw and tell a story in pictures. And my dream came true at the tender age of 18. Hi, my name is Alan Bellman, and I'm an alcohol. Oh, wrong meeting. Excuse me, that's my cane. Sometimes I like to raise cane myself. <laughs> Let's be nice to everyone. We cannot be everyone's friend, but let's try. There's so much going on right now. So please, please. Cheers. To learn more, visit alanbellman.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.